Hello and welcome to the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant. Our guest today is Dr. Regina Hampton. She's a breast surgeon for Doctors Community Hospital. Welcome, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, thank you for having me. I wanna start off talking about the disproportionate number of African American women who, uh, who get breast cancer each year. Why are the numbers so high in the African American community? So as African American women, we get breast cancer less than white women. However, our mortality rates are higher, meaning that we get breast cancer less, but we die more often. And so there are many factors that go into that. Uh, one of the factors is, is that we tend to get breast cancer at younger ages. So white women tend to get breast cancer over the age of 60 whereas black women tend to get it under the age of 50. Um, and so that presents a problem in that the breast cancer in younger women, because of their age and because they're still uh, having menstrual cycles and have higher hormone levels, it can tend to uh, give more aggressive breast cancers in women under the age of 50. Do, uh, should we get tested earlier then? Should we start getting tested in our mid-20s opposed to getting tested at 40 or 50? So unfortunately, mammography is best as we get older. So when we have young, uh, I call them the perky breasts, the mammography uh, screenings are just not as good because of dense breast tissue. So as we get older and our breasts start to get more fatty and start to droop, that's actually when mammograms are better. So trying to do screening in women that are young, we probably wouldn't see anything anyway and we probably would miss a lot of cancers. So the current recommendation is to start at age 40. However, if you have a family history, and this is why speaking to our families and knowing the medical history of our families is so important, it is important to know who had breast cancer and at what age. Because if they develop breast cancer at younger ages, in those particular women, we would start screening at younger ages. Usually. So genetics has a lot to do with it? Genetics does play a role in it. Um, so there is the breast cancer gene or the BRCA gene and the BRCA mutation um, that can let us know what a woman's real risk is for developing breast cancer. However, again, in disparate populations, African American and Latino women, there just has not been enough testing so that we can see all of the mutations that are out there that we need to be aware of. Are there other tests besides mammograms that are available that can detect breast cancer? So the good thing about mammograms is they've gotten better. So we're moving into the era of 3D mammography or tomosynthesis. And what that does, when you look at the machine, it's gonna look like the same machine. However, it's going to take multiple pictures throughout the breast. Um, and you will be in the machine for probably about four seconds longer. But what it's doing is it's doing pictures in one millimeter increments throughout the breast and then we can take those pictures and put them together on the computer and be able to see something dead center in the breast that we may not have been able to see on our standard 2D mammography. So that is the good news in that mammograms are getting better. Uh, we also have breast ultrasound which we mm -hmm. use and we have breast MRI that we can use also in special cases. So are those more comfortable? Most women, if you're anything like me, you just dread having to get a mammogram and having your breast pulled and tugged and tightened. And so or is it getting more comfortable or are there methods that are coming available that make it less, because uh, it's, it's not painful, what's the word? Less invasive, less uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Yes, uh, the good thing is that it doesn't last long. Uh, you know, there are some special pads that can be placed on the machine to make it a little more comfortable. You know, I always like to explain why mammograms are so uncomfortable and why we have to do the squeeze. Yes, please explain <laughs> that. <laughs> Help the me. The reason for that is because if we just put our breasts into the machine without doing the squeeze, it's going to look like everybody has something wrong. And then everybody's gonna go down this path of having to get ultrasound and possibly having to get a biopsy every time you have to go. So we do the squeeze, or the, we call it compression, um, so that our normal tissue settles out, so that just the abnormal things stand out on the picture. 
And so that's a good thing because we certainly wouldn't want to get biopsies every year when we have to go. And so the squeeze is very important and helps us really to distinguish what's normal breast tissue from something that's abnormal that absolutely needs to get worked up. If you, um, if the doctor sees something and wants to do more testing, that's not the end of the world. Just because they see something there, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have breast cancer. Correct. So what I often tell women is when you get that letter that says, hey, Mrs. Smith, you know, we couldn't make a final determination. Come on back in so we can take more pictures. You know, the first thing I say is just take a deep breath. You know, it just means, A, somebody's really looking at your mammogram, which is what we want, and B, it means they just want to get a few more pictures, more mammogra uh, mammogram pictures, and possibly an ultrasound, so they can see what's really going on. Most of the women, once they go back, everything's going to be fine, and we'll say, you know, Mrs. Smith, come on back next year. We'll see you next year. Very, a smaller percentage of those women, it's going to be like, well, something still looks a little abnormal, and we need to do maybe another test or to possibly do a biopsy. The good thing about doing the biopsies is it can be done in an office setting under mm. local anesthesia with a very small scar, no stitches, and we can get the answer back in about two to three days max. So that is really a big improvement because at one time, everyone had to go to the operating room and have surgery in order to have a biopsy. A couple of years ago, um, I had a little scare. It turned out to be nothing, but I know from the time we did the mammogram to the time they had to do a second mammogram, it was, it was several weeks and it was torture. Yes. So that's why I wanted to emphasize to women that just because they need for, doctors need further testing, that doesn't mean you necessarily have breast cancer. Every ugly picture of being sick, of my children were small at the time, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what are we going to do? It's not the end of the world. Absolutely. What I say is, you know, abnormal imaging, a mammogram or ultrasound is just that. It just means we see something and we need to get a little bit more information. The good thing is that 80% of the biopsies we do are going to be negative or benign. And again, come back next year, we'll see you next year. Only 20% of those are going to be positive. And the good thing is for those women that are positive, most of them are going to be treatable. So breast cancer is not what it used to be back in the 40s or 50s. Because of advanced technology, we're finding cancers earlier. And for a stage zero or stage one breast cancer, the five-year survival rates are almost 100%. When we're checking ourselves, when we're trying to do those preventative uh, things, is this still the best thing is just to do self breast exam? And when you do the self breast exam, what exactly are you looking for? So I still think self-breast exam and, and some other organizations prefer to call it self-awareness, knowing your body. I think it's very important. You know, I say until women stop coming into my office, finding their own lump, um, when that happens, if that ever happens, then I'll stop telling women to do it. But until then, I'm still a big advocate that once a month, um, if you're still menstruating about seven to ten days after the start of your menstrual cycle to check your own breasts and what I say is think of it as I'm learning what my normal lumpiness feels like you're not gonna find something abnormal every time and that's a good thing but you want to learn what your normal lumpiness feels like so if something ever feels different you'll know that you need to call your doctor to get that evaluated further why seven to ten days um, after your cycle is that um, the ovulation period before or after why that period of time because during our menstrual cycle our breasts will fill up with with cysts fluid filled pockets so a lot of women say oh yeah around the time of my menstrual cycle my breasts feel heavy and they feel like a sack of rocks those are fluid filled pockets that occur naturally around the time of the menstrual cycle due to hormone levels and so we don't want you to get confused and think oh my god I'm feeling all these sack of rocks there's something going on in both breasts so once you can let that settle down and that usually happens towards the tail end of the menstrual cycle then you're really feeling what what your natural breasts feel like and again they're gonna be lumpy we expect there to be lumps but the question is oh, is this just my normal lumpiness or is this a lump that shouldn't be there what excuses do you hear for women who come in at you know the late stages of breast cancer what are some of the things they just ignored the symptoms or mm -hmm. so one of the things is that ideally there are no symptoms I mean we would prefer that either a woman finds a lump which usually will be painless 
not causing her any pain. Um, and when she gets a mammogram, there's something, a finding on mammogram, and it's not causing any symptoms. Um, women that tend to come in with later stage, you know, the lump is bigger, they may notice, oh, my bra's not fitting quite the way it used to fit. You know, I do feel this lump, it's not getting smaller, it did not go away with my menstrual cycle. Um, as the lump gets bigger, it may start to cause some pain and pressure. Uh, they may notice some discharge from the nipple that may be blood or red. Um, but I've also had women who've come in with really big cancers that didn't cause them any symptoms. And they say, well, it didn't cause me any pain, that's why I didn't come in to get it checked out. Or some say, well, I didn't want to get it checked out because I didn't want to know that it was cancer, um, mm. which is always, um, it's, it's heartbreaking because, you know, I want women to be proactive and when there's something that you know you weren't born with, you need to get that checked out and it doesn't mean that even if you're diagnosed with breast cancer, it's not a death sentence. Again, for an early stage breast cancer, the five-year survival rates are almost 100%. I don't think there's any cancer that we can say that, but we're really winning when we talk about breast cancer and I think that's the good news. So once you've received that diagnosis, what are the usual treatments available? So the mainstays of treatment are surgery, radiation, uh, chemotherapy, and hormonal therapy. The good thing is that we're in an era of what we call personalized medicine, uh, meaning that not everyone is gonna get the same treatment, and that's a good thing because every cancer is different, and so we respond to how is that cancer telling us to treat that particular woman? And I could bring 10 women in this room today and they probably have all had a little different treatment. Some of them have just maybe had surgery only. Some have maybe had you know, surgery and chemotherapy. Um, it's really about individualized care and not everybody gets all four of those treatments. It could be a combination of those, and even the order that we give the treatment can be changed around as well. And what you just mentioned is the fact that most times it's been successful. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, the five-year survival rates for even the stage four breast cancers are increasing. So we don't want people to be at stage four, and stage four means that the breast cancer is spread beyond the breast. But, you know, because our treatment regimens are getting better, um, you know, we're able to make a lot of stage four women live for healthy lives for quite a long time. What if you are one of those women whose grandmother had breast cancer, your mother had breast cancer, your sister had breast cancer, and you wanna consider being proactive in getting your breasts removed to remove the risk? Mm -hmm. And as we're seeing, some Hollywood celebrities mm -hmm. have done that. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? So I think before making that decision, I think it's important to find a breast specialist who runs a high-risk program so that you can really have a conversation to see, well, what is your real risk? Um, is there an actual genetic mutation that that woman or her family members are carrying, like the, the BRCA or the BRCA gene? Um, because those that carry the BRCA gene are at a very high risk for getting breast cancer. And I always say Angelina Jolie is the one yes. in the news. So Angelina Jolie is BRCA or BRCA positive. What that meant for her is that she was at almost a 90% risk of getting breast cancer. 90% means she was going to get breast cancer. Mm. We just couldn't tell her at what age. She was also at risk for getting a second breast cancer, and that risk is up to 65%. And she was at a very high risk for getting ovarian cancer as well. So her conversation with her doctor was looking at those numbers, and for her, she made that decision to have both breasts removed. Now, with having both breasts removed, her risk does not go to zero. It goes down to less than 1%, about a half a percent, which is better than that 90% that she had staring her in the face. So for women that have a strong family history, I think it's important that you find a breast specialist um, and even to get genetic counseling so that the family history can be mapped out. And that would include, well, who had breast cancer and at what ages and what type of treatment they got. And are there any other cancers? Is there lung cancer? Or is there brain cancer, stomach cancer? What other cancers, because some of those can play a role and can contribute to the risk. And then with sitting down, and I always say it should take multiple visits, not you go in one visit and decide you're gonna have 
both breasts removed and have a bilateral mastectomy. Because they're not coming back. Right. It's a big decision. <laughs> it is. It's a big decision, and I think it, it really takes time to think about all the options and really to get all the information so that you can make an informed decision. You know, the good thing about for women who choose to do bilateral mastectomies is the reconstruction and the reconstructive aspect is so much better. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, the times have definitely changed. What options do you have as far as plastic surgery is concerned and, and how has it improved? So uh, when we talk about just the surgery aspect, we can do what's called nipple sparing mastectomy and this has made you know, mastectomy more attractive to younger women in that the skin and the nipple, everything about the breast stays the same. Usually we hide the scars underneath the breast or on the side of the breast, and then we fill that in. That can be filled in with something uh, man-made, uh, like a, an implant. Um, or we can take someone's natural tissue. We can take the muscles um, and tissue and some of that belly pooch that we all have and yes. hate uh, from the, the belly, and that can be used to recreate a breast. We can take tissue from the back. So we can move tissue from other parts of the body to recreate a breast. Once you've recreated that breast, is there sensitivity there? In many cases, no. So you will lose the sensitivity. And with the nipple sparing, you have the look of the breast, but that sensitivity and that sensation is gone. How does that affect your uh, fertility, having uh, breast cancer? Well, it depends on the type of treatment that you have. So if you are just having surgery, usually fertility is not affected. If you're going to need any hormonal medications or chemotherapy, uh, fertility can be uh, affected. And so we oftentimes try to you know, figure out what a woman's fertility options are or what her desires are, especially if she's a young woman. Yes, especially women mm -hmm. who are in their 20s and they're dealing with this. And you're looking down the road and thinking, okay, I, I dreamed of having a family. I dreamed of having children. Will yes. I still be able to? Yes. So, you know, we usually will send them to meet with an infertility specialist ahead of time, especially if she's going to get chemotherapy, um, to look at options of freezing the eggs to prepare for a later date. Um, sometimes with hormonal medications, um, fertility can be affected. You know, now there have been some women who have gotten chemotherapy and have gone on to conceive, you know, after getting chemotherapy. So it's one of the things we like to try and plan ahead if we can. Um, but there are also other options, you know, adoption is a great option, surrogacy is a great option. So we try to find out those desires before giving the treatment so that we can try and meet her needs down the line. What is the healing process like? So it depends on the amount of surgery that you're having. So when we talk about surgery options, there's lumpectomy or just taking the lump out. Uh, that's also known as breast conservation um, or a mastectomy, which is removing the entire breast tissue. Um, so it depends on the amount of surgery. So usually for a lumpectomy, you know, the recovery time is anywhere from five days to two weeks, depending on the person. Uh, for a mastectomy, again, depending on if she's getting reconstruction or not, that's going to usually be one to three weeks. Let's talk about some preventative things that you can do to stay healthy if you are at risk of, of breast cancer. What does diet and exercise, or what role does diet and exercise have to play in all of this? So, you know, exercise is good for everything. We certainly encourage everyone to try and get at least 20 minutes of exercise three times a week. You know, that's not only going to help to decrease your risk for, you know, cancer, but it's good for your heart as well. Um, so we still recommend that. We recommend a low-fat diet. We find that women who put on uh, significant amounts of weight, especially after menopause, can put them at higher risk for breast cancer. Those fat cells like to hold on to that extra estrogen, which puts us at, extra, uh, at a higher risk for breast cancer. Um, as far as diet, you know, low-fat diet, we're not quite sure what foods to stay away from because it's really hard to get a good study to say, well, it's lettuce or it's green beans that are the cause of breast cancer because in order to find that out, someone would have to sign up to live in a bubble and only, you know, ingest that type of food to see does this or does this not. I don't know, I like ice cream too much, so I'm not going <laughs> to sign for that study. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll do the ice cream study, but probably not the green bean study. So I think it's really hard, but I think, you know, trying to live healthy lives, trying to fit in a little bit of exercise is going to be good not only for preventing cancer, but also keeping your heart healthy. What's the likelihood of the breast cancer returning? in most cases? So for the average woman, the risk of recurrence uh, within the first five years is about 1% per year mm -hmm. if you complete all the required treatments. So if you don't complete all the required treatments, then your risk can go up significantly. And once you've completed the treatment, I'm sure it's on a case-by-case -case basis, but eventually, after months or whatever, you can go back to living your life? Absolutely. You know, I'm of the belief that, you know, even once you're diagnosed, continue to live your life. You know, I have women, when they get chemotherapy, they continue to work every day. We encourage them to work out on days they feel good. You know, my thing is breast cancer should not disrupt your life. Continue to get your treatments, but I, my patients know my motto is keep it moving when you have a breast cancer diagnosis. So, you know, it's not what it used to be where women would be, you know, laid out in a bed for six months while they're getting chemotherapy. You know, we have women that live active lives and as practitioners, we encourage them to do so because it makes them feel good psychologically. It makes them feel like, you know what, I still can play with my kids. I still can work. I still can, you know, do my Zumba class even though I'm getting chemotherapy and going through this diagnosis. It really just brings the psyche up. It psychologically keeps them in a good place, a good happy place while they're going through a difficult time. I've also heard that sometimes the treatment um, can be more painful or disruptive than ha all, having the disease itself, meaning that sometimes things like chemotherapy can be hard on the body. It can be, uh, but we're doing a better job, again, with the individu individualized uh, care in that each woman is going to, or man, because men get breast cancer too, each woman is going to get the treatment prescribed for her. So when they do chemotherapy, it's based on, on your weight, your height and weight. So not everybody's going to get the same dosage. Um, and the oncologists do a good job of really adjusting the dose. If they see someone's having a hard time, they'll back down on the dose and maybe extend it out for a longer period of time so that we can get that woman through. Um, again, a lot of my patients work full time while they're getting chemotherapy. They may they say they feel worse on maybe day three or four, and they may you know take that day one or two days off. But by day five, six, they're up moving, and they're only getting chemotherapy once every three weeks. How important is it to keep a good relationship with your doctor, whoever your doctor is, to really know your doctor and make sure that you have someone who is compatible with your needs and what you're going through? I think it's very important. You know, I'm all about energy and karma, and if you meet with a doctor and you're just not getting that good vibe, it's okay to go get a second opinion um, or even to find another doctor. I think it's such a, a stressful process. There's a lot going on. And to go to a doctor's office that you're not completely comfortable with, that's just not helping your body heal. So I always encourage women, you know, if you feel the need, feel free to get a second opinion. Or, you know, if that doctor's not working for you, it's your right. Patients have the right. You can fire a doctor. Um, and you don't have to give a reason. If you just don't feel like it's just not working or that person's not taking the time to really understand your needs and not only understand what you're going through with your treatment, but sometimes there are social issues that we're going through that contribute to us having a difficult time in our treatment. And so you really want a, a, a team of doctors who really are going to take that into consideration. Because you're not just going through this, your spouse or your significant other is going through it, your children are going through it, so you've got to, uh, I guess the, the doctor has to be very sensitive to that. Absolutely. Go ahead. Absolutely. You know, it's really a team-based approach, um, and so you know, at one time in cancer care, the doctors all worked in silos. So the surgeon did their part and the, the oncologist and nobody was talking. Nowadays, it's really multidisciplinary where at, certainly at our institution, we sit and speak and talk in a conference once a week. And we discuss every case. We may hash it out and go back and forth with the pros and cons. But at the end of that meeting, we come to a consensus on how we're going to treat Mrs. Jones going forward. That and is so reassuring yes. to hear. It really is. Before we wrap up the show today, let's go over one more time when 
and how often should a woman get a breast exam depending on the family history? So if there's no family history, uh, women should get a mammogram once a year starting at age 40. Uh, they should do their own breast self-exam monthly at, at home. Um, and they should see their doctor at least once a year and get a, what we call a clinical breast exam. If there is a family history, then the woman would need to know at what ages the women in her family got breast cancer. If those women were under the age of 50, then we may want to start about 10 years earlier uh, starting to do screening in that family. Again, still doing a uh, breast exam once a month and following up with her provider. And there are going to be some women who say, well, I don't know what to do. This feels weird. Where do, where do you start when, when you do the breast exam? I know we can't do one here <laughs> <laughs> on set, but do you start from the top and work your way up or start sideways exactly? Uh, what do you do? It, because it is. This is it feels odd. Yes, yes. So it's always the big thing is is opposite hand to the opposite breast. Okay. So some women try and use the same hand. Yes. You're not going to be able to get a good a good exam. So opposite hand, opposite breast. You'll want to raise the arm up because that helps to flatten the breast tissue out. Um, and there are many different patterns. You can start from the outside and work a circle and wake in. You can start in and work a circle way out. You can kind of work up and down as long as you cover the full breast tissue and also get the area underneath the arm as well. Why? Because uh, there are lymph nodes under the arm and there's breast tissue there as well. And so sometimes women won't have a lump in the breast, but they may have a lymph node that is enlarged and feels like a lump. And that's just as important as a lump in the breast. But opposite hand <laughs> to opposite bre breast, rather. You learn something new every day because I wasn't quite sure. And a lot of us, we want to ask those questions, but we don't know who to ask and we don't, may not know how to ask. Yes. So, so this kind of stuff is very informative. And I always say, you know, if your significant other wants to help, Help. they can help you do a breast exam most of them are happy to do so <laughs> but you know my thing is as long as somebody gets to know what that breast tissue is like and to be able to say hmm something feels a little different here we should go get this checked out and it's worth the five minutes it takes to do it absolutely you can save your own life by just taking a few minutes after your shower absolutely or during this. the shower you know I often tell women you're already soapy you're already wet you can do it in the shower. My thing is I don't care when you do it, Just who do it. does it, as long as it gets done. Thank you so much. We've been talking. It's been my pleasure. We've been talking to Dr. Regina Hampton. She's a breast surgeon at Doctors Community Hospital. Hopefully you'll come back and always, as the show progresses, give us more and more information. This is so valuable. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You've been watching the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant. Have a great day.